You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Please join me for the call of worship. Let the light shine. Let the light shine in you. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Please stand and join in singing our opening hymn. This is a day of new beginnings. Before you are seated, I invite you to extend a hand of greeting to those who are seated around you as we welcome one another to worship this morning. You may be seated. I want to welcome everyone to worship this morning. I especially want to welcome guests who are with us today, some of whom I imagine are here as we celebrate the confirmation of four young people in our congregation. We extend that greeting to all of you. And because this is a Confirmation Sunday, we also invite you especially to come to our time of food and fellowship between services. Today that will give you an opportunity to con congratulate and greet our four young confirmands and their families and their mentors. I also want to call your attention to the fact that when you depart worship today, you're going to see far, four large post-it 
greeting cards. They're about this big, and we're going to invite you to sign a name or send a, a, write a greeting to our four confirmation youth, and you'll be meeting them uh, later in our service. And also, you will see displayed four posters that they put together in our confirmation retreat two weeks ago that express some of the things that have been important to them through this confirmation journey. So sign the greeting card, uh, take a look at the poster, and please uh, greet them after, after worship today. I call attention to the many announcements that are in your worship bulletin and commend them to your reading uh, following our worship service today. At this time, I'm going to invite one of our confirmands, Nick Kipstege, to come forward. Uh, one, of the, one of the projects that our confirmation class worked on uh, during our retreat a couple of weeks ago is that the students, the parents, and the mentors each constructed part of the liturgy for today. The call to worship that you just heard uh, was put together uh, by the students. And uh, they also selected some scripture readings as part of that exercise. And one of that scripture readings is from Hebrews. And I invite Nick now to bring that scripture to us. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching.
we come with joy today to recognize the faith journey that some of our young people have taken this past year. All of us are on a faith journey, of course, and as we come to a time of prayer, we have the opportunity each week to lift up those places on our journey where we have seen God, where we have experienced God's grace, and also those areas in which we have concern and would like to pray for ourselves and others. Some prayer requests have been made known to me this morning as we have come together to worship. First of all, I would ask you to keep in your prayers Mary Lou Storley, who is hospitalized in Edgerton, uh, Maurice Cal, who is continuing to recuperate in Edgerton and hopes to return home soon. I'd like to invite you to keep Janelle Wendell Schaefer and her family in your prayers. Her son, Craig, continues to heal and recuperate from a very serious accident continue to pray for him as well as the rest of your family, Janelle. And I would ask you to invite God's special grace to continue to be with Judy Wenham and Joe Holt as they continue to mourn the loss of Gordy and um, that they would be surrounded with strength as they continue to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and their beloved husband and father. I would invite, if there are any of you who have other prayer requests this morning, a joy that you wish to share or a concern that you would care to lift before God and one another today. Yes, Jenny. to keep Charlie Mitchell in our prayers as he continues treatment for his illness and Reva as well. Um, they were with us in worship last Sunday. I don't believe I see them here this morning, but we continue to pray for them. Thank you, Jenny. Jerry. continued healing of Jerry and Sue's daughter-in-law's uh, mother, and, um, and we are appreciative of your sharing uh, her journey and keeping them in prayer. for prayers for Dave Green, a good friend and uh, uh, who passed away as they were preparing to go on a cruise. Thank you, Dave. Yes, Joe. Prayers of gratitude for Joe's son being released from the hospital and strength as he continues to recover from that ordeal. Thank you, Joe. Yes, Jelaine. Several young men, Boy Scouts, are now a Boy Scouts. They were Weedlows who crossed over in a ceremony right in this very place. You told me you were going to leave the little podium up here today. Um, but congratulations, Thomas, and all of your uh, friends who are, are now full-fledged Boy Scouts as of this week. Thank you. Yes, Kona. Joshua is graduating second in his class at the Air Force School he is at, and that graduation, amen. <laughs> kind of a big week for the Beery family, isn't it? Congratulations. That's awesome. Yes, Paul. Amen. Paul's. Paul's believing we don't have to wait for the groundhog in three days. Paul says that winter's coming to an end. He saw a flock of robins in his backyard. Amen. Friends, let us bring these prayers and those that live in our hearts this day before our gracious God. Oh God, we lift these names before you today. 
those who are near and dear to us, those whom we love, those of our acquaintance. We ask that you might draw close to them to celebrate their accomplishments and their achievements, to, to continue to support them in the endeavors to which they have been called. For those who are ill, O oh God, be a presence today that you might encourage them and give them the strength that they might need, mostly to know that you are present with them in all things. We give you gratitude for healing, for recovery. We ask God that you be with us in the ways that we don't even lift aloud, the, perhaps the small concerns and anxieties that we carry with us into worship this morning, the, the to-do lists of things left undone, the, the tasks that might lie before us this week. Help us to lay them at your altar today as an offering of, of trust to you, that you will be present in all of those things and accompany us and that you would not send us anywhere or invite us to go someplace that you would not go with us. God, we thank you for the opportunity and the privilege and the challenge to be your church. Today, as we celebrate the faith journey of four young people, we are reminded that all of us are on a journey, and each day we have the opportunity to grow and learn, and for that we give thanks. God, may our worship today be acceptable to you as we lift our prayers and our songs of praise. Be present amongst us. And hear us now, O oh God, as we lift together our voice as one, as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to add one other prayer request that I see that I inadvertently omitted before our prayer time, and that is for Michael and Alice Dotting. Each of them are receiving some specialized medical care this coming week, and I ask that uh, we keep them in, in our prayers as well. Friends, I now invite us to continue our worship gladfully and joyfully by bringing before God an offering of our tithes and our gifts let us give generously for our good and the good of all Christ's church.
O oh, gracious God, we place these gifts before you, humbly asking for your strength and your wisdom, that as your church we might use them faithfully. We might use them compassionately and urgently to be salt and light to the world, the world looking for and needing the good news of your gospel. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Customarily, we have a time during our worship service called Young at Heart Time when we invite the young people to gather with Elizabeth, and we didn't forget it today, but because of our confirmation liturgy, we're going to just ask that when it comes time to celebrate our confirmands, uh, that perhaps our young people would be able to, to watch that and, and to, to aspire to something that they might themselves go through someday, and we do indeed invite and encourage all members of the body of Christ to worship with us each each week. You know, I have memories of attending the church when I was the age of some of the folks sitting at the round tables here. I have memories of being a part of the church when I was the age of our young confirmands and a little older when I was in high school. I'm not going to lie because it's not good to lie. Um, you know, not all of those memories were necessarily sacred memories. Uh, you know, I remember when my best friend and I volunteered to uh, monitor the live radio broadcast of our church service, which we, which we had at the time. And back in that day, you had to sit in a control room and call the radio station and make some electronic connection. And why it took two of us to do that, I'm not quite sure. But I can tell you in that year, I don't think my friend Wes and I uh, heard much of any of the worship service or the sermon. And, uh, and he was the pastor's kid. Um, <laughs> so... Um, not all of our memories are, are, are necessarily the ones that you would think about in church. But you know what? That's an okay thing because I always told my mom it was better to be in church not paying attention than to not be in church and not paying attention. And the reality is, and I know this to be true, that even when some of our youngest children will leave church and their parents have no idea if they paid any attention at all, they'll be halfway home and somewhere in the middle of the conversation they will say something that they heard in worship. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And I think we all do that, don't we? Even if we look disinterested, if our ears are open enough and our hearts are open enough, we still absorb some of the good news. And that's not to say that there aren't, no matter our age, from real spiritual experiences that happened. And one of the spiritual experiences that happened to me as a high school youth is that I was part of a high school Bible study. There were five of us who had been invited to meet on Sunday evenings, and we met with our youth leader for a Bible study. And I remember one particular night. I probably went 25 times, and I don't remember 24 of them necessarily, but I remember the one. And the leader invited us on a piece of paper known only to us. We didn't share it in the group. Write down one word that you want to pray about this week. And for me, the word was patience. Even as a high school youth, I knew that I had a problem with patience. And we wrote that word down, and we folded it up, and we put it in our pocket, and he said, simply pray each day for that thing that you ask for. And it was one of the first experiences I had about a faith that could really change lives because it really made a difference. And by that following Sunday, we were asked to share our experiences. And I had never felt patience in my life before that week. So I know that regardless of our age, that powerful things can happen when the Spirit breaks through and gets into our inner consciousness. And it also makes me think about what, what things will our young people today remember? Now, our confirmation class met, I don't know how many times in this past year, several, several times. I am sure that these four bright students remember every single thing that we talked about with Emmerich and Ben. But on the rare case they didn't, I'm praying that something stuck with them. Maybe, maybe it would be today's scripture passage. Maybe it wouldn't. Today's scripture passage is about salt and light. 
It's a well-known scripture passage. It's a powerful metaphor that Jesus used, salt and light. The light one is fairly easy to figure out. Where there is darkness, light enters in and breaks through. You know, the salt image is a, is a little trickier. I was thinking about this the other night. I, I guess I'm not too proud to say that I actually had, well, it's rather embarrassing, I, except I was, I was caught by one of our, our staff members. I actually had dinner at the new Quick, quick Trip the other night. You know, it's two blocks from the parsonage, and it was late, and I, so they have a really good pork sandwich. <laughs> but I was, I was at the quick trip, and I was trying to figure out a to-go with, something to go with it. And you know, you walk into a place like this, and there's just stuff everywhere. And I realized, basically, that a convenience store like that sells three things, and they all start with S, soda, sugar, and salt. The, sh- the soda is obviously all around the outside, and then there's the aisles of stuff, and I was trying to figure out what's where. And it occurred to me, well, this is the sugar aisle. This is where all the candy and the chocolate is. And then the aisle, it's the salt aisle, right? It's where all the pretzels and all the potato chips are. Salt, sugar, and soda. Jesus talked about, Jesus talked about salt. Before I get to salt, because it's a little harder to understand, there's a remarkable scene in the book of Revelation. And our confirmation students will tell you that the book of Revelation is where in the Bible? It's the very last book. Of course they knew that. And there's this remarkable scene in the book of Revelation where Jesus is standing and he's knocking on the door of the church. It's a church in a place called Laodicea. It doesn't matter where it is. And the, the image typically of that, of that scene is that depending on whether the, the members of the church open the door or not, that depends on whether or not they're accepting or rejecting Jesus. But that that misses a rather important point. Because right before that, the church is being rebuked. That's because that, that is, they're being criticized. And you know that why they were being criticized? They were being criticized because they were not either hot nor cold, but they were lukewarm. And that's a pretty strong word. Because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. It's quite a biblical image, isn't it? It's not a compliment, certainly, particularly when God is speaking. And the point is, it's better for a church to be hot or cold than it is to be lukewarm. So back to the salt. To say that we are to be the salt of the earth implies that we are to bring some flavor into the world as Christians, into our relationships with one another. Salt has an edge, doesn't it? There's a little bit of an edge in salt. It has a satisfying taste. It makes, it can make come alive what otherwise might be tasteless and bland. And if you've ever been on a bland diet for some medical reason, you, you know what the absence of that flavoring tastes like. In certain circumstances, salt can actually be used as a preservative, right? We don't think about this much anymore, but salt was used to preserve food back in the days when they were traveling by ship. Salt can keep food fresh for an extended period of time. So when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, it seems like Jesus is telling the disciples and therefore us that we have a a capacity to bring goodness to the earth as does salt. Like salt, which can alter or improve the tastiness of food, we have the capacity to elicit goodness in the earth and in our church and in our workplace and in our schools. And that's pretty profound. The danger, I think, that Jesus is getting at is that we have the capacity to lose that potential as well. Forgetting that we are, as Christians, called to care for those who suffer and to seek to do justice and to show mercy and to have integrity and be honest and to be peacemakers and courageously stand for what we believe. That's what it's like to be salt. And if we forget that, we become lukewarm or bland. And you remember what God said about being lukewarm in our faith. 
Jesus also uses the image of light. He says, we are the light of the world, and this light should not be hidden but seen. If you put a light under a bushel, you're not going to see the light. Elizabeth shared that in a children's message a few weeks ago. If you put a flashlight in a paper doll, it's not going to work. We often interpret that to mean, I think, that we're not to hide our gifts and our talents by putting them under a metaphorical bushel. And I think we sometimes use that as an encouragement to someone to, to step forward, to, to relinquish your shyness, to come out of hiding. But I'm not entirely comfortable with that because some people are just naturally introverts. And I don't think Jesus is, call, is causing everybody to have to get up and speak. I think there's something deeper. There's a different reason that we are called to shine as Christians, and that is because there is a darkness in life. Many of the things that we pray about come from an area of darkness or concern or sorrow or illness. And life isn't all about that, but we know that it exists. And some of it's external and some of it's internal. And so Jesus encouraged us as, as followers to bring light to a dark and broken world. The light is the light of the gospel, which means good news. And just like light in the middle of a cold, dark night can draw people in, the good news of the gospel draws people to its warmth and its radiance. And that is our call. In the gospel that, or in the scripture reading that Nick brought to us earlier, let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. That's the task. That's why we come together to provoke one another, to encourage one another to do the good, and that is to be salt and light in the world. There's a former archbishop by the name of William Temple who was quoted as saying, the church is the only organization on earth that exists for the benefit of those who are not members. Think about that for a minute. The church is the only organization on earth that exists for the benefit for those who are not members. That means it's not just about us sitting here today. In order for the light to be seen, we must be willing to go out where the darkness exists to engage it and to walk through it so that in time, the light can overcome it. There's a writer by the name of Annie Dillard who says, you don't have to sit outside in the dark. However, if you want to look at the stars, darkness is necessary. We can be that necessary light. We can go into a dark place if we can bear the light of Christ. The light isn't just given for our own personal enjoyment. We need teachers along the way to help us figure that out. We need teachers throughout our Christian journey. The Jesus taught the disciples. The disciples taught others. We are the recipients of the disciples' teaching. Beth and Emmerich Gunderson taught our confirmation students this year. I have benefited greatly from teachers. One of the teachers I had was David Lowe's in St. Paul, and he says this about this passage of salt and light. He says, we are tempted to hear this passage as Jesus requirement rather than as a blessing, as a command rather than a commissioning. Let me make that clear. We've told our confirmation students from the beginning, we want you to learn. We invite you to learn. We want to give you the vocabulary of faith so it can make sense that when you hear these words and when you try to understand God, you have some words to help you. But I told them from the beginning, we're not going to give you a test at the end of confirmation to see whether or not you pass. Because that's not the way that Jesus operated. Pay attention to what Jesus said. He said, well, let's, let, let's, let's think about what he didn't say. He didn't say, if you want to become salt and light, you got to do this. Or, before I call you salt and light, this is what you have to do. No, what Jesus said is, you are the salt of the earth. 
you are the light of the world. He says it simply and directly. Jesus' words are sheer blessing and commendation and affirmation. And they are words of commission. We are commissioning these young people today. I've told them that we aren't confirming them. They are confirming their Christian faith by being present today. But we are commissioning them. Now, some of our military folks might know the meaning of the word commissioning. In that context, means to appoint someone to the rank of officer, right, in the armed services. That's not what we're commissioning our young people today for. We are commissioning these young people to serve outside these walls, out in the world, in their schools and in their homes and in their family and with their friends and with acquaintances and with people they don't even know. And we're not doing that because they pass some sort of confirmation test. We're doing it because Jesus has already said to them and to you and to I, you are are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world I want to close by saying you may have heard of some of the stories about children's self esteem in relation to the messages that they hear and psychologists say that for every negative message a child hears who's in elementary school for every negative message they hear about themselves they need to hear 10 positive ones in order to restore their sense of self to the level it started from in other words children believe they are who they are named if you call a child bad long enough he or she will believe you and act badly if you call a child or an adult for that matter worthless or unlovable or shameful Eventually, we will all live into the name that we have been assigned. And the same way, if you call us good or dependable or useful or worthwhile, we will grow into that behavior and identity as well. And so Jesus says, you are salt and light. Not just the confirmation students, all of us. And each time we come to worship, we all are commissioned. And Jesus gives all of us his blessing and his affirmation and his commendation. And so today I want to give you that gift. I want to give you the gift of God's affirmation and trust. And I pray that we as a congregation and we as individuals might gain the confidence in our identity as God's chosen and beloved children. Those called to be salt and light in the world and gaining that confidence that we will evermore truly become what we have been named. And, you know, age doesn't get us out of it young or old or in between, all of us have been given a name and an identity. One of the other scriptures that the confirmation class worked with during our retreat was this. It's in 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. And I would add to that, don't look, let anyone look down at you because you are old. Or any other adjective you want to add. Do not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for others in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Thanks be to God. this time I would like to invite to come forward the parents of our four confirmands if they might come today and and gather around either side of this table and I'm going to invite Lisa to come forward as and take the podium as 
She is going to share a parent's prayer that the parents wrote at the confirmation retreat. I'll invite the other parents to, to come on the other side of the table and continue to face outward to the congregation. Let us pray. Bestow upon these young adults the wisdom and guidance they may need as they move through their journey of faith. Give them the courage to let their light shine, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Encourage and empower these youth to share their faith with others so that all hear your good news. Amen. I'm going to invite each couple now to take the light that comes from the light of Christ that entered the sanctuary today, and I'm going to invite each couple to light one of the small candles in front, if you would, and then pass on to the next person. Jack and Tona, the parents of Jackson. Joel and Jill, the parents of Logan. Chris and Lindsley parents of Nick, and Nick and Lisa, Lisa, the parents of Janet. One of the joys that I had is working with this confirmation class, along with Emmerich and Beth, their teachers, and Elizabeth, our staff member, is that when I had the opportunity to attend the retreat with them a few weeks ago, we got beyond the conversations that we only get to share on a Sunday morning. And I want to commend these families to you as an example of salt and light. They're working out the struggles of raising the children and raising a family and, and being who they are called to be in the world, while also having the identity of being the parents to these wonderful young people. And just as we say at the baptism of an infant, they do not do so alone. And they, you all do so with the encouragement of this faith community and others. And I want to commend you for the families that you have brought here. And I pray that this experience will continue to draw you together as families as well. And we are very pleased and proud to have you a part of this celebration today. Would you show them a sign of affirmation as parents today? Yes, thank you. Now I'm going to invite the parents to return to their seats, which is metaphorically a hard thing to do when a parent watches a child get to a point where others have to, have to help out, if not take over. And at this point, I would like to invite the mentors to come forward, as well as Emmerich and Beth and Elizabeth, and I'm going to invite you to... Um, invite the mentors to come right to the table as well. This year we reinitiated a mentor program under Elizabeth's, Elizabeth's guidance and um, we couldn't be more pleased with the fact that these mentors have taken time outside of the confirmation class to meet regularly over the past several months with these young people and uh, we are very grateful to them and, and I'm now going to ask them as well to light candles from this Christ candle. The light has been brought as the parents have brought these children to this class and the mentors have now continued to fan that flame. So if you would light each of you one of the larger candles. Leah was the mentor with Jenna. was the mentor with Jackson. Matt, the mentor with Nick. And Dave, the mentor 
the globe there. We have several Boy Scouts in our confirmation class that could probably help out. And Girl Scouts. I want to thank you as well for the roles that you have taken with these young people. And now I'm going to invite the mentors actually to come and stand behind here as we invite our confirmants to come forward as you symbolically will stand behind them. I'm going to invite Emmerich and Beth to do so as well. Emmerich and Beth Gunderson, members of our congregation, uh, have taught this confirmation class. They've met every two weeks essentially since last January except for the summer. And uh, we are very grateful for them and their role. I'm going to invite our confirmation students right now to come on either side, just as they have. And that's if you would like to return to some of these that are in there. God is in this place. And the doors of this place open wide. That those who seek faith, hope, and love may find it here among us. Dear friends, today especially we support Nick and Jackson and Logan and Jenna, with whom we have walked on this journey of faith, whom God has sought out and brought to this very moment, so that they might confirm their faith in Jesus Christ in the presence of the Holy Spirit and God's church. They have been strengthened to deepen their relationship with Christ's beloved community. So in the name of Christ, let us, as the gathered church today, renew our vows to accompany each other on this journey of faith with Christ's church. And I invite the congregation to please respond. Any moment. It begins with, with God's help, we will proclaim the good news. Let us repeat these vows together as a congregation. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. So they have just made a promise to you that they will not just simply sit there and be lukewarm because God doesn't like lukewarm. But they will continue to support you, not just today because you are confirmands, but because you are a part of the body of Christ. And that you do not have to go through life alone, that this community will always be a part of you and you of us. And so now I ask these questions of our confirmands. And in response to each question, I will invite you to respond by saying, I do, and I ask God to help me. So Nick, Jackson, Logan, and Jenna, I invite you to respond together. Do you seek to learn and follow the teachings of Jesus? And I ask God to help me. See, that's an important part because, again, you're never alone. God is always there. Now the next time you're going to say it loud enough so God actually hears it. Okay. <laughs> I do and I ask God to help me. Do you seek to love the Lord with passion and wisdom and to act that way towards your neighbors? Do you seek to be compassionate, kind, and patient, to be willing to forgive other people and be thankful? And do you seek to grow in faith, to trust that nothing can happen in life that can separate you from love of God? One of the beauties of confirmation is that an opportunity for all young people to come and to learn about their faith. Three of our confirmation students today are taking the additional step of joining the United Methodist Church. And so Jackson, Logan, and Jenna, I ask you, do you pledge to be a faithful member of Christ's Holy Church, to be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church, and to faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, would you say, I do, and I ask God to help me? 
we ask that all of you, wherever you find yourself in the body of Christ, might go with God's Spirit to be with you. And in a moment, I'm going to ask a blessing upon you. First, I would like to invite Elizabeth to give you your confirmation certificates uh, first to each of our confirmands and uh, then a certificate of appreciation to our mentors as well. Jackson and Logan. Jenna and Nick. And we have a certificate of appreciation for our mentors as well. Elizabeth represents Dave, Jerry, Matt, and Leah. We have something for you too, but you're going to get it at the second service. <laughs> In a good way. <laughs> That's right. I'm going to invite our mentors to come forward to stand behind the confirmand that you worked with this year to place a hand upon their shoulder as I prepare a blessing. And I'm going to ask the congregation if you would just extend your hands as if reaching out in blessing to these young people. Let us pray. Eternal God who gave birth to us and to all creation, we give you thanks for Jenna, for Logan, for Jackson, and for Nick, whom you sought in holy love and called to this day. Inspire them with a passion to know you and to live your way in this world. Nourish them with your wisdom and word. Form us all together as your people, one in your Holy Spirit. In the name of Christ Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you please stand and join in our closing hymn? invite our mentors or whoever is participating in the final blessing to come forward. The mentors are going to offer the final blessing today. Before they do so, again, I want to encourage you to come into the fellowship hall on your way. Please look for the large post-it greeting cards uh, that are there, and I assume that there are marker pens out and about so that you can sign those for each of the confirmands. And then please do join them in the fellowship hall for uh, that you have an opportunity to meet and congratulate them. And uh, there's a very small fine print in the United Methodist Book of Worship that says on an occasion such as this, you must have cake. <laughs> so we do have cake 
to celebrate as well as other other things for our fellowship. So I now invite our mentors to bring us our final blessing. This uh, scripture we're going to read from Philippians 3, verse 12. And we made some changes. Instead of I, it's going to say you because we're going to have to confirm this thing. So this is from us to you. Not that you have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but you press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, you do not consider yourselves to have taken hold of it, but one thing you do, forgetting what is behind and straightening toward what is ahead, you press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called you heavenward in Christ Jesus. Being asked to help as a mentor, a mentor to confidence, has brought an, an awareness and of encouragement to us on our walk of faith. To gain enlightenment in expanding our learning and teaching of the confident ones, as well as our own. I'm going to pray now. Lord, I pray for what you've done here today and for our confidence. Lord, I pray that you continue to strengthen them in their faith as they go forth. And continue to show them your glory and your awesomeness, Lord, as you reveal to them just the great mystery of who you truly are, Lord. I pray that as they go forward, that they wouldn't be afraid to share the gospel of what your salvation is, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.